Praise the most high God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Peace to everybody that's here in the name of Jesus. Peace to everybody that's listening on the line and also uh, tuning in on the internet. I'm glad to have everybody observing the beginning of the Lord's plan for salvation of mankind, which is the Lord's Passover. And through the, through the scriptures, the Lord is showing us a, a master plan that he put together for the salvation of man. And this is the beginning of that plan. That's why, like we dealt with earlier, this is in the first month. It's the first observance of the year for all that recognize who the real God is and want to be delivered by the real God. And it means what it say, all of God's days mean something and they're not even hard to figure out. And this one is no different. It means what it say, it's called the Passover and it signifies us being passed over for wrongdoing. When we could be destroyed the Lord has made a way, if we have faith, to be passed over. And that's what this day signifies. And it just shows you how awesome God is that he set it up in ancient times, but it's still significant for us today. That's why Jesus, he came at least a thousand years after the day was announced by God and set up. And he came and it wasn't no coincidence that he paid the ultimate price on the very day. Because the Lord is omnipotent. He know what he was doing in the beginning. He planned it all the way to the end. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't believe that. They don't believe that God ordained his holy days for important reasons that they are good forever. So we're going to take a look at it. But before I get started, we got some chairs up here, but I don't see nobody sitting there. The brothers were supposed to be sitting up here in the chairs. All the brothers that labor and uh, kind of what we would call the elders who keep things together here. They supposed to be up here, so they gonna, we're going to let them come up here. We got other brothers, of course, that's, that's, that's out of town. Devin and, and Brother Wayne, both of them out of town, doing the same thing we're doing right now. Well, Devin haven't started yet because they're they on Western time, specific time. But, uh, and we got brothers in the back that's working because the work still got to go on. So, But these are a few of the other brothers who labor throughout the year and basically keep things together. And we also got sisters at labor, but tonight we're just going to have the brothers sit up here if that's okay. <laughs> but now, we're going to start this lesson off in Revelation, the 13th chapter, because it goes to show you that people, even people that say they believe in Jesus, they, they act as if Jesus just dropped out the sky and he didn't come with any type of reference or any type of pedigree. But that's not the case. Jesus says, search the scriptures because they testify of me. And when, and when he says, search the scriptures, there was no New Testament written to search. So he was referring strictly to the Old Testament. So that's where you need to get your reference point or else you will find yourself believing in another Jesus. That's what Paul told you in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter. He said, other people, they preaching another Jesus. See, if you haven't understood or recognized the Jesus of the Passover, the one that came and died on the Passover, which is a shame. I know people believe, say they believe in Jesus all their life, and they don't even know that the day that Jesus died was this day, the Passover. The same day that we celebrate. They don't know. Because Satan in halfway obscured it where people call it all kind of stuff, the Lord's Supper. 
the Last Supper, everything but what it is in the Bible, in the Bible that they have. So people have been saying they believe in Jesus, but they have never even heard of the Passover, don't know that he is the Passover, don't know the significance of it. That's right. And that's, that shouldn't be, but again, the Bible says Satan have deceived the whole world. So what we are doing now, God planned it a long time ago, and it still has significance for us to this day. So the title is The Passover Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The Passover lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And this goes to show you, Jesus just didn't come on the scene, pop up one day and say, hey, I'm here to die for your sins. It, it didn't happen like that. It wasn't coincidence. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't something just helter skelter thrown together by God. No, it was already a master plan by God. He planned it from day one. Because God is omnipotent. He knew man was going to mess up, but he had a way for man to get out of it. That's where faith come in at. But you show your faith by what you do. See, we showing our faith by being here tonight. It ain't, it, we ain't doing nothing major. We showing our faith. But people act like when you talk about things in the Old Testament, see, they had to do works. And, you know, we got some faith now. No, this is showing our faith. Israel didn't do nothing to get saved from the death angel in Egypt except put some blood over their doorposts in Egypt. Ate the lamb and put the blood over their doorposts. That, that wouldn't stop nobody, would it? You try to, you, that don't normally keep a murderer out your house, right? Say, well, it's a murderer running around. I'm going to go put some blood over the house. <laughs> no, nah, that don't keep nobody out your house. Unless God set it up that way and said, you got to have faith in my plan and be covered by this blood. So that was faith in, 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 in action way back then. And we're showing the same faith today. With Revelation 13 and verse 7, the Passover lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 and verse 7. Okay, go ahead. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints uh -huh. and to overcome them. Uh -huh. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now this is referring to the, really the beast and the Antichrist doing great tribulation as fast approaching. So, and this shows you something that a lot of people think when the mark of the beast is being thrown, it's going to be given out. A lot of people think that, you know, you're going to be raptured to heaven. The saints don't have to worry about that because they're going to be raptured off to heaven. But this is showing otherwise. It said it was given unto him to make war with the saints. So whoever the saints are, they're getting war made on them, right, at this time. And he got power with this individual or this team, got power over all people all over the world, over all the Kendrick's tongues. and He got some power everywhere. That's why it's going to be hard to escape if you don't make it to the place of safety before all this go down. It's going to be hard to escape. That's why Jesus didn't say wait on the rapture. He said when you see certain things to flee, and he got a place for you to flee. He had a place when Israel fled from Egypt. They didn't even know where they was going. They didn't even know which way to go. They ended up boxed in at the Red Sea, but they still made it. So that's what that's talking about. But we want to get to the next verse. But this show you again, he's going to be forcing people to worship his way. That's why he's going to kill the saints, because the saints going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're going to be telling them, e e even if you kill me, I'm still, I'm not going to bow down to your image. See, the saints going to have that understanding. That's what a lot of Israelite brothers need to realize, and even some of the Muslim brothers, you know, they're doing a lot of talk about, oh, what we going to do? We're going to do this to the heathen. It's our time to rule something. Look, it's going to be a whole lot of people getting killed before you rule anything. Right. You better be getting ready for this. That's what it said here. It said it was given him to make war with the saints and who win it? What did it say? And to overcome them. So that means the saints being overcame, right? See, a lot got to transpire before God's kingdom come and the righteous rule. See, the wicked rule and they're going to rule till it's over. And they're going to... Fight with every fiber to keep that rule. That's why they're even going to fight the Lord when he come. So he overcoming them. And the people that don't know no better, everybody's going to be worshiping this system. Go ahead, verse 8. 
And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. See, the majority of people are going to be worshiping this Antichrist. Because he have deceived the whole world now to believe he is somebody special. It said, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. But who are they? Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. See, their names not written in the book of life of the Lamb. They don't know no better. Their names not written in the book of life. That's the only way you're going to worship a lie. You don't know the Lord. Or else you worship a lie and don't know. But when you find out, you will turn away from it. Well, this is going to be the ultimate test for the world. See, people think you can worship any kind of way, but God going to show you. He going to draw a line there and say, look, you either on my side or you're not. So and the people that's not on this side, they going to worship. Their names are not written in the book of life of the lamb. But what lamb? The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Oh, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, this is what the title is. The Passover lamb. Slain from the foundation of the world. This show you Jesus that didn't come and end up dying coincidentally. Now, it was planned from when? From the foundation of the world. It was already mapped out, orchestrated. That's why God gave us a holy day way back in the beginning of time to signify. It wasn't nothing new. But now, go to Exodus 12. Let's go back to the beginning. He said it was... The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So that plan of Jesus, who is the lamb, and we're going to see that, being crucified was planned in the beginning when God laid everything out. That's why he started revealing in Exodus. And he gave us a day to honor the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And we have, we have thrown it away. Exodus 12, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Exodus 12 and verse 1. And oh, the, go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying. Now again, the Lord spake, not Moses. The Lord told him what? This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. See, this is the beginning. Go ahead. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Uh-huh. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, uh -huh. according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Uh -huh. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. So everybody had to partake in this lamb. Every single solitary person had to partake in this lamb. Go ahead, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. See, your lamb had to be a perfect specimen. It had to be without blemish, and it had to be what else? A male of the first year. It had to be a male, and it had to be the firstborn. A male of the first year, go ahead. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat. See? So it was specifications about this lamb. But we're going to come right back here. Go to 1 Peter 1. And we're going to see if something sounds familiar. Keep your finger in Exodus 12. Go to 1 Peter, the first chapter. And we're going to come right back here. Show you all this was mapped out long ago and came into play when the Messiah himself came. 1 Peter 1. And 18, and then we're going to go back to Exodus 12. Okay, go ahead. For as, ye, for, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the traditions from your father. See, he tell it, the Gentiles that you know you wasn't redeemed with corruptible things. See, people make all kind of things God in this world. They make money of God. They worry about their job more than they should. But that can't redeem you. That can't get you salvation. That can only keep you going in this life. But it, can't, it cannot redeem you and get you salvation. So you don't get redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain way of life that's been passed down. But what, what redeems us? Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. Ah, oh, well, with the precious blood of Christ. See, again, that wasn't no coincidence when Christ came and shed his blood. See, the Lord already had the prototype. He had the example. Been in existence for years. 
That's why Israel should have definitely recognized it. He had the example. And the blood of animals couldn't save you. It was just teaching you that some blood had to be shed. It couldn't save you. Because animals hadn't committed the sin that got us in trouble. So he said with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish, just like the lamb had to be in Exodus, right? It had to be a perfect specimen. Go ahead, verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. That's telling you again that Christ, truly, him coming and dying, brothers and sisters, was ordained when? Before the foundation of the world. This was planned way back, even before Exodus. It just came, he just started putting it in play in Exodus. What we read in Exodus 12. He started putting it in play, showing you, but it was planned before that. God know what he's going to do before he do it. He didn't just come up with a plan. He had a master plan. And he's showing you this is the first of his plan, the beginning of his plan, the Passover. Then we're going to get into the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it's a continuation. And you got the rest of them all showing you what God is doing to deliver man. The first thing you got to do is pass over us, give us a second chance. So he said, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but what? But was manifest in these last times for you. See, it was planned long ago, and finally when he came on the scene, he, he was manifest. Manifest for us. But now, let's go back to Exodus 12. You had a marker there, Exodus 12. And we're going to pick it up right where we left off at, at verse 6. So that show you that Peter understood that Christ fit the bill for what Moses got in Exodus 12. 12 and 6 now. Go ahead. And ye shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. See, you had to get the lamb in advance, prepare for it, have a lamb. Then on the 14th day of the same month, you kept it up until then. Then on that day, what happened? And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. See, then he said the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. See, that's why we're here in the evening. But go ahead. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Uh-huh. Then they had, to, they had to put the blood over the house. Like I said, but that wouldn't stop nobody from coming in and killing you unless the Lord said it that way and told you to have faith in his plan. So, but this blood already is showing you. Like I hear people talking about all oh, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Well, you're reading about the blood of Jesus right here. Because that's, right. that's what saved the people. The blood of the lamb wasn't nothing to God. The physical lamb. That wasn't nothing to God. What saved the people is what the blood of the physical lamb stood for. What did it stand for? None other than the blood of the Messiah, Jesus. But now skip down to verse 11 because they got the lamb, they killed the lamb, they put the blood over their house, and they end up eating this lamb, partaking in this lamb. Verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, mm -hmm. and your staff in your hand, uh -huh. and ye shall eat it in haste. Mm -hmm. It is the Lord's Passover. He said you have to eat it in haste, but whose is it? It is the Lord's Passover. Some people, when you say about the Passover, they say, oh yeah, that's the Jews. You do, oh, you do what the Jews do. No, it said what? It's the Lord's Passover, didn't it? Yes, it did. That's who Passover. It's not a Jewish Passover. There's not a Christian festival. It either belongs to the Lord or it don't. And this, the Passover belonged to the Lord, right? Now you want to talk about something else. We talk about what people when we recognize in Good Friday and Easter. That don't belong to the Lord. You got the other one who started that, who trying to imitate the Lord, and that's Satan himself. But notice, he got stuff right at the same time to trip you up. So instead of you doing, it's a shame, you got all this written in the Bible, but people act like it ain't there. And we'll get, we'll kind of get upset with you. Oh, are you doing that? Well, why are you doing that? Well, why are you doing what you're doing? It ain't written nowhere you can find. And people will argue with you and they will, won't you? Well, where's that at? 
and prove that and prove, and how you know it's the 14th day? Well, how the heck you know when Easter is Easter? You ain't never questioned one time. You ain't never found out, well, how do they get to Easter? You just took the Pope's word for it. And it don't mean nothing. So it's a shame. We read this out the Bible and people will dispute it. That show you Satan and mess some folks up. He says the Lord's Passover, right? right. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. See, the Lord said, look, I'm going to come through the land of Egypt. He didn't have to do it personally. The Lord worked through individuals. He sent a, matter of fact, he sent an evil angel through there to do it. But the evil angel couldn't come unless the Lord allowed him. The Lord gave him free will to go on through there, gave him an open door. Say, go ahead and take care of the business. And they love to do some dirt. So he said, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will do what? And will smite all the firstborn in the land of he Egypt. He said, I'm going to kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I'm going to show you who run this. This was God putting his mark on the world way back here. Go ahead. Both man and beast. Both, not even just man. He said man and beast, didn't he? Go ahead. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. Uh -huh. I am the Lord. He said, and I'm going to smack all your gods around, Pharaoh. I'm going to slap them around, and I'm telling you I'm coming, so tell them to stop me, because here I come. I'm going to execute judgment. That show you it was other gods. Then ain't no other real gods. They are all fake gods. And God was proven right here that he was the real God. See, God is a jealous God. He don't like you on another God. So he done all this to do what? To prove that he is the real one, right? That's right. He said, look, I'm the one and only true and living God, and I'm sick of this mess. I tell you what, I'm coming through Egypt. Stop me if you can. I'm going to execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. He said, look, I run this. Verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. Oh, see, this is the token note. This is the way you're going to escape. Go ahead. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. See, that's pretty simple, ain't it? You don't even have to figure out what Passover means. Now, you go trying to figure out what Easter really means. They told you it was a resurrection. All you got to do is look a little deeper. You'll find out it got something totally, it means something totally different. Got something to do with Easter eggs and bunny rabbits. Fertility. It's a goddess that you honor. It's one of the gods God is executing judgment against. It's a fertility goddess. That's why they got Easter eggs and bunny rabbits, because it's about fertility rights. Don't have nothing to do with Jesus. But don't nobody know that. But we know what the Lord is talking about, right? The Lord is plain, isn't it? Right in the Bible, I will pass over you, right? Go ahead. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you uh -huh. when I smite the land of Egypt. See, you won't get plagued when he smite the land of Egypt, but you had to follow the instructions, though, right? If Moses himself wouldn't have followed the instructions, somebody would have been dead in this house. The Lord don't is no respect the person. That shows you again it's common salvation. It's no personal. Moses could have said, Well, you know, I was up there talking to the Lord. So uh, I ain't really think I got to put the blood over my house, but y'all go ahead and do it. Look, Moses would have been burying somebody. Guarantee you. That's what the Lord is saying here. So he said, look, and we're going to read that as a matter of fact. He said, look, when I, I will pass over you when I see the blood. That's a token. And I will pass over you in the place and I be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. But now, this is the Passover. You did all this on the 14th day of the first month, he said. Verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Oh, now this day, what day are we talking about? We ain't talking about nothing but the Passover. Matter of fact, we ain't seen nothing about unleavened bread yet, have we? Even though in other places you find out you have to eat unleavened bread with the Passover as well. But this is still simply the Passover, right? This day shall be unto you for a memorial. Go ahead. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. A feast to who? To the Lord, right? right. See, we have feasts and anniversaries for the pastor. We have all kind of stuff, but won't do what the Lord say to honor him. Right. A feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Go ahead. 
Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now that's a long time, isn't it? When did forever stop really meaning forever? It didn't say forever until Christ came, did it? People don't understand. Skip down to verse 29 and go ahead. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. See, we're going to we, we read the rest of that on Monday when we deal with the Feast of Unleavened Bread because that's when he go into Unleavened Bread after that. But now at verse 29, he said at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. So this still got to be the Passover. And because this is when he passing over the people. He smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From what? From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne uh -huh. until the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon. See, he wasn't no respect of person. He didn't have mercy on Pharaoh, and he wasn't lenient on, on the slave in the dungeon. All firstborns had to die. Even the animals had to die. Go ahead. And all the firstborn of cattle. Uh-huh, verse 30. And Pharaoh rose up in the night. See, he rose up in the night. It, it, it happened at midnight. So by the time they woke up, you know an hour or two went by when they grieving over their dead. That's how I know Israel didn't lead to the following evening. But go ahead. He and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt. Oh, sure it was. Can you imagine that? Just say if the Lord say he going to do that to any country nowadays. Any country, just say the Lord say he going to do that. You talking about some crying and some burying, huh? He said there was a great cry in Egypt, and Egypt was the greatest country of its day. That's how the Lord worked. He started the top busting heads. But go ahead. For there was not a house where there was not one day. Isn't that something? Everybody got somebody dead in their house. They're going to try to defy the Lord. Pharaoh going to tell Moses, who is the Lord that I should let Israel go? See, that's the way people feel now. <laughs> Who is the Lord that I'm going to listen to you? Well, the Lord just showed him, didn't he? There was not a house where there was not one dead. So he called Moses. He said, look, y'all be gone. Go ahead and get up out of here. Get your stuff. Get your cap. Take everybody. Because he was, he was playing with Moses. Talking about, well, I'll let you go, but leave your kids. Like, Moses was like, oh, okay. He, said, he was kept playing with Moses. Well, leave your cattle here. But this night, he got up. He said, look, take everything. You go. Be gone. And bless me also, will you? He knew it was over. Then he got big-headed again and went to chase him. I did let him go. Why I do that? He couldn't believe that it was somebody more powerful than him. He couldn't believe that. That didn't make no sense to him. That shows you, you got to realize there's something more powerful than you, no matter how much power you seem to have. But now, skip down to verse 43, because he's going to give you even some ordinances, which we let people know that to, to this day. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is brought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. Okay, now this is the ordinance. No stranger couldn't eat of the Passover. But if you had a servant that was yours, you had to circumcise him, then he could eat thereof. Go ahead. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. See, but somebody that was just a straight stranger among Israel, a hired servant, somebody passing through or whatever, they couldn't eat thereof unless. Only way somebody outside of Israel could eat, because this for anybody, they had to commit to the God of Israel. That's right. They couldn't just say, well, I'm just in town tonight, y'all having a party, I'm going to come and, and, and enjoy it with y'all. No, they had to... Commit to the God of Israel. That's why he said he had to be circumcised. Go ahead, verse 46. In one house shall it be eaten. Mm -hmm. that, that, don't mean, that don't mean one house, period. <laughs> Just like we got people in this house going to eat it and another house going to eat it. But that means wherever you at and eating it, that's where you're going to stay. But go ahead. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house. Mm -hmm. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Uh, just like Jesus. That's why when Pilate went to break his bones, had somebody break his bones when he was on the cross, they said, oh, he already dead. So they didn't break his bone because that's what they did to kill him, to send him in a shock so they can die once they punished them enough on the cross. Because they had plenty of people on crosses in those days. That was a custom. That's why it was two people on crosses with Jesus. So, but they didn't break his bone because of the scripture. 
He is that lamb. All that's in order. Go ahead. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. See, Israel didn't have no choice in the matter. They was chosen by God. They didn't have no choice. They couldn't say, well, look, I don't feel like keeping it. And I don't want to keep it. Now, they didn't even have no choice. You're going to keep it or you're going to be in trouble. So, and he, that's why he didn't even have to mention Israel had to be circumcised because they automatically were circumcised on the eighth day and they kept it. The only thing in question was the Gentiles had to fall in line. The other nationalities, the other nations, whether they have might or Gentiles or whatever, they had to become a part of it if they didn't know about it. But all the congregation of Israel should keep it. 48. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover. Now, a stranger could keep it. See, he just couldn't keep it and go on about his business and think it was just a one-time event. He could keep it. See, he said before it sounded like he was saying a stranger couldn't keep it. That's what he said at the end of 43. There should no stranger eat there. But in other words, he's going to give you the requirements or the prerequisites for a stranger to keep it. He just couldn't keep it and remain a stranger. He had to become part of the family to keep it. That's right. And to do to show he was willing to do that, he had to take that big step and get his flesh cut of his, all the males. And then he was part of the family. He was part of the covenant. That's why it looked like Paul and them ruled out the Gentiles from getting circumcised. But really, he did. They just gave him time on a lot of stuff in Acts 15. I know he didn't rule it out because he turned around in Acts 16 and they circumcised Timothy, whose father was a Greek. He circumcised him. Because, but there was a whole lot of stuff included in that conversation besides physical circumcision that people not aware. Right. They was talking about sacrificing everything that the Pharisees was trying to push on them. But now he said at verse 48, and when a stranger will sojourn with thee and do what? And will keep the Passover uh -huh. to the Lord. Uh -huh. Let all his males be circumcised. See, he could do it, but he had to show he was for real, right? You know, that was going to really show some faith. You said, look, y'all, you want to do this with us? Okay, you believe in the God of Israel? Yeah, I, I, I like your God. I believe in it. Okay, I tell you what, we got somebody over there going to circumcise <laughs> Then they said, oh, what? Wait, oh, 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 wait a minute. That was going to be a test of faith right there, right? That's what he said. But because of this, now we got Israel. Some Israel not circumcised, so we tell anybody that ain't circumcised that you, you shouldn't partake in this meal. Even though technically all Israel is supposed to do it, but all Israel should have been circumcised. So anybody that ain't circumcised, we just, to be safe, we just tell you, even if you can come here and be here today, but just don't eat of the, of the Passover meal because we don't want to take no chances. Because he said, look, if a stranger will join on to the Lord and keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, then what? And then let him come near and keep it. Mm -hmm. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. That's right. He's just like you now. Go ahead. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. See, so that's why we say that. If you ain't circumcised, just sit this one out. And go ahead and get circumcised. And it, it show you, though, it's not a one way for the Gentiles and another way for Israel. What he said, 49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, uh -huh. and unto the stranger, so that sojourning among you. See, so other people were welcome, wasn't they? They were welcome, but they had to become a part of the commonwealth of Israel. That's what Paul told the Ephesians. They had done. The Ephesians had become a part of the common. He said, before you was aliens from the commonwealth. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You didn't know nothing even about God. He told them. He told him point blank in Ephesians 2. He said, you Ephesians, he said, you, you, didn't, you was without hope and didn't even have God in the world. But now we didn't showed you about the God of Israel. You have become a part of the fellowship, the commonwealth of Israel. But now let's go to Leviticus 23. So that's how it all began in Exodus 12. That's when the Lord started revealing what his plan was for man. But he told you this plan started at the foundation of the world, didn't it? That's why he can talk about it in Exodus. So when you get to Matthew, Luke, and all of that, it's old business, isn't it? That's right. It's old business. It's been done. This stuff been planned. That's why Jesus knew what he had to do. He knew what, what mission he was on. We just don't know nowadays. We didn't try to give Jesus a new mission and twist it all up. 
No, he was on the old mission. He was old school. Leviticus 23 and verse 1. He come right out of here. That's why when he opened his mouth, he always quoted the Old Testament. Even when he fought with the devil, he smacked the devil upside his head with nothing but Old Testament scriptures. Leviticus 23 and 1. Go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying. Again, the Lord spake unto Moses. Moses didn't come up with it. It is the Lord's Passover. Go ahead. Speak unto the children of Israel mm -hmm. and say unto them. Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocation. Concerning the feast of the Lord. Holy gatherings you're going to have on these occasions. Go ahead. Even these are my feasts. These are my feasts, God said, not the Jews. There are no, there is no Jewish Sabbath and Christian Sabbath. There is no Jewish holy day and, 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 and Christian holiday. It only belongs to the Lord. And if it don't belong to the Lord, you better check that God. You better check that God out. Because God said don't have no gods before him, right? That's right. So why is it so hard to just do what he's telling you to do in the scriptures? How can you go wrong with that? Especially when you know, people say all the time, well, I know the Bible is the word of God. It's the word of God. But you're doing something outside the Bible. And saying you believe in it. So he said, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations. You proclaim them in their season. Even these are my feasts. Verse 3, go ahead. Six days shall work be done. Uh-huh. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. Uh-huh. And holy convocations. See, that's the weekly Sabbath, which we celebrated earlier before sundown. Go ahead. Even ye shall do no work therein. Uh-huh. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Not the Jews. The Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. We can do it here. Even though we long way from home, we can do it here. But go ahead. Now he's going to get into the annual ones. And this is the first one of the year. This is the beginning of God's plan for the salvation of man. Verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocation, uh -huh. which ye shall proclaim in their season. See, the, the weekly Sabbath is every week. But the seasonal ones come once a year. Starting with this one, the Passover. And he's going to tell you. The, but again, he said, these are his feasts, even holy convocations, which you both going to proclaim in their seasons. Now, you're going to proclaim them at the set time in the year. And you can still calculate it to this day. That's how we know today is the 14th day of the first month, because God got it set that way. That's why we know it's going to be a full moon tomorrow because a full moon is the middle of the month, the 15th day, when the feast day comes. God's plan is constant. You can always figure it out. But go ahead, verse uh, 5. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Again, whose Passover? The Lord's. The Lord's. People say that all the time. I'll see y'all, you doing that Jewish stuff. Are you Jewish? This is Bible. The same Bible they got too. He said in the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. But now we're going to go to the New Testament because we saw Moses and them did it. And all of Israel did it. So let's go to Hebrews 11 because again, people say, yeah, that was good back then. But once Christ came, you know, he nailed it to the cross. They just lie on Christ all the time. They should be scared. They should be scared. They just lie on them all the time. They lie on the Bible. And they say, oh, yeah, see, they had, see, they didn't know no better back then. Like Moses was stupid. And here Moses, man, talked to God face to face. But they act like he was stupid. You see, he didn't, Moses didn't know. Bless his poor heart. He tried. He gave him them silly days. We got the real days now. That don't make no sense. And you can't read your day nowhere. Can't read it nowhere. Can't read nothing about no Easter bunny in here. You can't read about it. Can't read nothing about dressing up, going, I mean, that's what, growing up as kids, that's what we all did. You wouldn't go to church all year, but you went on Easter Sunday. What kind of sense do that make? You might as well just miss that one. You ain't went all year. But you had to go show them new clothes off you got, so... Because that's what you did. See, but that ain't in here. Hebrews 11. 
That's where they make plenty of money when Easter come around. They know people going to be buying new clothes, a bunch of candy, everything. Hebrews 11 and verse 24. But see what Moses and Israel did with the Passover, which came out of God's mouth. That's just meager stuff. You know, yeah, they had to do them works. You know, we just got faith in Christ. Look, they had faith in Christ. That was Christ who ordained that. That's the true faith in Christ. We're going to show you that was faith. They call it works, right? Look, your faith without works is dead. So what you do show your faith. So, yeah, they had to do something, but they didn't do no real work again. They didn't get up there and stop the deaf angel from coming in. They self did they? No, they had faith in God's plan. They did what God said, and that stopped the deaf angel. Uh, Hebrews 11 and 24. Go ahead. By faith, Moses. Oh, that's some faith. See, that's one thing you need to get straight. People that lied and said faith like it started in the New Testament. Moses and them didn't know nothing about no faith. See, they, they just, they was just back there. They didn't have it yet. It said faith, right? By faith, Moses went what? When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So it sounds like the New Testament understood that Moses had some faith in the Old Testament, right? right. Let's see what else he had faith. Verse 28, go ahead. Through faith. He oh, through faith again. You mean faith was abounding back there, wasn't it? And Moses had some, didn't he? Through faith again, what? He kept the Passover. Oh, through faith he kept the Passover, huh? So that was an exhibition of faith, wasn't it? And we exhibit in the same faith today. Through faith he kept the Passover. Go ahead. And the sprinkling of blood. And the sprinkling of blood. He sprinkled that blood. But what would happen if he did? Didn't. Lest he that. Lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Oh, he, he needed that faith, didn't he? That was life and death faith. That's how faith is. You're either going to believe God or you don't. Moses had faith, but I told you earlier, if Moses would not have did what the Lord said do, the Lord wouldn't have been no respect of person, wouldn't he? He wouldn't have said, oh, Moses, my boy, he, you know, he can get away with that. Now, it said he kept, the, he had faith. And he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. Lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. They would have got touched, right? And it wouldn't have been pretty. But being that he had faith, the Lord did what he said he was going to do. He can't lie. He passed over them, didn't he? Because they had faith in the plan of salvation. They had faith in Jesus, the Passover lamb. Long before he even came, the Lord had you having faith. That's show you that God is awesome, right? He ain't even came and did it. He got you having faith in it. So when it comes, it's just natural. It's just second nature by the time he come. Let's go further. Go to John 1. Go to John 1. John 1, and we're going to read one verse, verse 29. John 1 and verse 29. Okay, go ahead. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. See, John the Baptist, he knew who Jesus was. So he called him what he was. He said, Behold, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. How he know that? Look, this has been planned from the foundation of the world, right? So it wasn't nothing new. Jesus just finally was manifest for us. And the Lord had a witness of him, and that was John the Baptist. And he called him what he was, the Lamb of God. Where did this Lamb start? We saw it way back in Exodus, didn't we? But we saw in Revelation that the plan of the Lamb being slain was from the beginning, right? But now, let's go further. Matthew 26. Let's show you that the Lamb knew he was the Lamb. He wasn't, he wasn't ignorant about his mission. Jesus knew this. And we've been going to church all our life, some of us. And don't even know that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Not just any lamb. The Passover lamb and died on the Passover day. We don't even know that. I thought for years it was just the Lord's Supper. Until finally I started reading and somebody was reading it to me out the Bible. I said, what? You didn't tell me I've been hoodwinked. I've been bamboozled. I've been led astray. I've been run amok. Matthew 26 and 1. Go ahead. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these things, uh -huh. he said unto his disciples. Uh -huh. What did he say? Jesus talking, now what? 
Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. The feast of the Passover. What we've been talking about, right? What we started off all the way back in Exodus. Jesus ain't coming with nothing new, is he? He coming with the same old school teaching. He said, two days is the feast of the Passover, and what's going to happen? He's letting them know what? And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now, that's awesome. He pinpointed today. He said, you know, in a couple of days, the Passover going to be here, and I'm going to be betrayed. I got to die. On that day, not a day before or a day after, can't happen out of order. God is pinpointing it, isn't he? That's right. See, but we don't even know that. We've been thinking it was good Friday. That's what they told us, it was good Friday. See how, see how Satan obscured the issue? He done gave you something to replace it in your mind. So you don't even think about no Passover. He got you honoring some more foolishness. So you walk around happy because you off on Good Friday. And it wasn't even a Friday. That show you how bad, how bad the lie is. It wasn't even a Friday. At least they could have had half of it, right? And what would have been good about it under the circumstances? But it was good. It, it was a good plan that he's going to die on the Passover. But now skip down to verse 17 and go ahead. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where would thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? See, because you eat, you eat, we eat unleavened bread with the Passover, so they just joined them together. So they called it all the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or they called it all the Passover, which really the Passover is one day, not eight days. But they called it all that. But now go ahead. They said, where would you pre that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Though? That's what the disciples asked Jesus. They didn't say Good Friday dinner. They said the Passover, didn't they? Go ahead. And he said, go into the city to such a man. Mm -hmm. They said to him, the master said, my time is at hand. Uh -huh. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Uh huh. Now Jesus said he's going to keep this Passover, right? In Luke 22, he says specifically, he said, I have desire to keep this Passover with you before I suffer. But it's the Passover. Go ahead. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them. Uh huh. And they made ready the Passover. We keep reading Passover. It's a wonder that people don't know Jesus died on the Passover, isn't it? We read Passover three or four times in these few verses. Go ahead. Now when the evening was come, uh -huh. he sat down with the twelve. Uh -huh. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Well, that's what he said at verse 2. In a couple of days is the Passover, and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed and be crucified. But this is the night he with the twelve, right? Judas is there too, the betrayer. Skip down to verse 26 and go ahead. And as they were eating, Jesus took eating bread. Eating what, though? They eating the Passover, aren't they? That's what they eating. But now he going to show them this ordinance so you will know that it's, it, it never was really about that physical lamb you've been killing and eating since Egypt. He going to show them that it's about him. Didn't John just call him the Lamb of God? He going to let them know. See, so this is when he going to put... Put the emphasis on himself to, to let them know that it's about me. So this is what I'm adding with this day. I'm adding that you know it's about me. So from now on, you do this on this day to honor me. You make sure you do this. Some people say, well, you got to eat lamb. You can eat lamb, but you need to know what lamb is about. That's why you must eat the bread and the wine. You must eat the bread and the wine because the real lamb, is the one that's right now sitting at the right hand of the Father. But all this took place on what day? The Passover. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and did what? And blessed it mm -hmm. and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. See, he made sure they did it. Go ahead. And he took the cup and gave thanks. Now that was wine. See, and if you go back to uh, Genesis 14 where Melchizedek, which is really Jesus before he became a man, we can prove that. When he met Abraham, he gave him bread and wine. He brought forth bread and wine because that was showing you, that was foreshadowing this way back then because he was the priest of the Most High God and Jesus was about to become the priest, taking that position after the order of Melchizedek. But now he took the bread, took the wine and, and, and the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, said what? 
Drink ye all of it. Uh -huh, why? For this is my blood of the New Testament. See, this is what's going to start the new covenant. My blood had to be shed. It ain't about the blood of bulls and goats. That's what ratified the old covenant, the blood of animals. Go ahead. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. See, the body, the bread represent his body and the wine represent his blood. And we are recognizing that each time we do it. But when do you do it? You do it on the Passover. That's when he did it, right? He didn't do it every first Sunday, did he? He didn't say, look, this is the first Sunday of the month. We're going to do it this, and I want you to do it from now on. No, it, it was already planned. So he didn't have to make up nothing new. But go ahead, 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. He said, this is my last time until I come back and the, and the kingdom is, is set up. But now, 1 Corinthians 11, because this is where people get thrown off a little bit. 1 Corinthians 11. Even the Corinthians, Paul brought them into this thing and they got out of hand with what's called the Lord's Supper. They thought that, you know, we can do it any time. Every time we come together, come on, we're going to recognize the, the death of the Lord. We're going to have some wine and some bread. And they've just taken advantage of that, just trying to party and get drunk. <laughs> they were just getting out of hand. But they thought, you know, well, we can do it often. That's what people say. Well, see, he said here, we can do it often. So that's why we do it every first Sunday. Look, you don't recognize nobody's birthday every third Thursday, do you? <laughs> you don't do that. You, you have an anniversary of their birth on the day once a year that they were born. So if you're going to recognize his death, which is what you're doing, the day was already established long before he died. It's not hard to figure out. You're going to do it on the day he died. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 20. Read that. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. See, they thought every time they come together, we can eat the Lord's Supper. And he started talking about him. He said, y'all eating and somebody getting drunk and acting crazy. Look, this is not, this is not what it's about. But now skip down to verse 23 because he's going to tell them what it's about. See, so it mentioned the Lord's Supper. But we know in actuality it's the Passover, right? That's right. And he didn't give us no new ordinance that said keep the Lord's Supper every first Sunday or every last Sunday. Go ahead, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you. What, what, he, what he delivered to them, what he get from the Lord. Go ahead. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now notice, he said the Lord Jesus. Paul wasn't there, but he knew about it. He said the Lord Jesus, the same night. He's specifying that for a reason. The same night he was betrayed, took bread. Go ahead. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Oh, this do in remembrance of me. Jesus told him that. So now on the Passover, we got something else to do in remembrance of him, don't we? But it's still the Passover. He didn't even have to come up with a new day, did he? That's how awesome God is. Go ahead. After the same manner also he took the cup. Uh -huh. When he had supped, saying, uh -huh. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Uh -huh. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. See, he said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. That's the wine he gave him. He said, This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now, what does that mean, brother? Does that mean we can just do it often? That's what people say. Do that mean every time I have a cup of wine, it's in remembrance of the Lord? Come on now. It don't work like that. Or else that's what you got to say, right? Here, take this cup. Every time you drink the cup, this is for the Lord. I'm drinking for the Lord. No. See, that's why Paul specified on that Passover day you do that. Jesus went through the trouble to do, a, do it all on that day, and you're going to throw the day away and do it every first Sunday or every fourth Sunday. That don't make no sense. He did it exactly on that day. So he said, look, as, but now he said, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance. What do you mean? As often as you have this celebration, drink this cup and eat this bread. He told him to do it. As often as you do it now, you know it's in remembrance of me. You know this day is bigger than what it seemed like it started with in Egypt about a physical lamb. We know it's bigger than that. 
God got a point A, but hey, that was just to get you somewhere else. Go ahead, 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, uh -huh. ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. See, see, people say, see, he said we can do it often. So that's why we do it every fourth Sunday. Did he say do it often? No, he just said as often as ye do this. Every year that you do it, you know it's every year because you eat bread and drink some wine. You could do that every day, right? And each time you eat some bread and drink some wine, it cannot be about the Lord's death, is it? No. So as often as you have this service and you do it on the Passover every year, that's when you recognize the anniversary of something. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Is that too hard to understand? You don't have any memorial that you do it every month, do you? You don't do that. They talk about people that have died. They, give you, they commemorate Martin Luther King died and birth. They do it once a year, right? right? You know, President's Day. They do it once a year. So anytime you're going to commemorate something, you're going to do it on the day once a year. So, but he let them know from now on, which they didn't, they didn't understand that until he came and, sh and shed the light on it. From now on, you know it's about me. Because a lot of the disciples, they didn't even believe, they didn't understand Jesus had to die. They thought he was going to conquer the world back then. Peter was ready to fight. He said, Lord, let's fight. Come on. He even cut a man ear off. Said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, maybe I got to start it off for him. He's he, he a little shaky. I'm going to help him out. He chopped the man ear off. Jesus said, he said, man, I told you I got to die. You thought I was playing? He put the man ear back on. Peter was like, oh, this dude for real. I'm up out of here. They all ran. They like, he's talking about dying for real. See, they didn't get that. So he was letting them know, I'm getting ready to die. You got something to commemorate my death on the Passover now. You know the Passover is about me. Now, what verse you at? 27. 27. Okay, go ahead. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. See, it's just like before. You need to understand what it's about. It's serious business. So again, you not every time you drinking some wine or eating some bread, you can't make it about the Lord. He said, whosoever eateth this eat at this bread and drink this cup unworthily. So just like when, they was, when he gave the orders in Egypt, you couldn't just pass through and do it without understanding the significance of it. Then he told the stranger had to even get circumcised, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to be about it, in other words. You need to be about it. That don't mean if you knew. Some people say, well, I'm new. I'm trying, but I believe, but you know, I don't know if I should do it. Look, you ain't got nowhere else to turn. If you know this is the truth, then you need to do all you can to obey the Lord. This is just another part of it. Showing your faith. Go ahead. What verse? 30? 28. 28, okay. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. See, so you couldn't just be doing your thing and not being committed to the Lord and think you're going to partake in this. This ain't just another drink you having and another piece of bread you eating. This has great significance. It's not to be taken lightly. And it's definitely not to be done once a month, is it? Go ahead. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. See, so you need to know what it's about. That's what he was trying to tell these people. They just going crazy, eating and drinking. It's about the Lord's look. Come on, we're getting together to have the Lord's supper. Uh-uh, it don't work like that. But now, let's go further. We're going to come back to Corinthians. Go to Daniel 9, and we're going to wrap it up. Daniel 9. Because again, it was already foretold. Again, the title of the lesson is the Passover lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So all over the Old Testament, he was telling you about this. You know, you got some Israelites, they have a problem with, with you saying you believe that Jesus died for the sins of Israel and the whole world. They got a problem with that because they say, oh, ain't no man got to die for me. That's something that, you know, y'all made up. But they say they believe in the Old Testament. So I asked them this about the Old Testament because they don't believe in Jesus at all. 
They don't, they don't have a problem with the name. They got a problem with the person. Some people have a problem with the name. They say you got to call a particular name, and they can't get that one straight yet either. They got a whole lot of correct names, true Hebrew names you need to call. But these people, they got a problem with the person. But Daniel 9 and verse 24, Daniel 9 and verse 24, but they say they believe in the Old Testament. But they got a problem with Jesus being the Messiah, the one anointed to come and save Israel and had to die to, to get it started. 9 and 24, go ahead. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Now Daniel was praying about the restoration of Israel. He was praying about the condition of Israel, seeking some advice from the Lord. And the Lord gave him an answer. He said, Seventy weeks are determined on your people, Daniel. Go ahead. And upon thy holy city uh -huh. to finish the transgression. To finish the transgression. Go ahead. And to make an end of sin. Mm -hmm. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. Uh -huh. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Uh -huh. And to seal up the vision and prophecy. Uh -huh. And to anoint the most holy. See, 70 weeks is to complete it all. And it's only a half a week left. At this point, it's a half a week left and the Messiah going to do that when he come back. But at, from that time, it was 70 weeks and we're not here to deal with that. But a lot got to be done. It's going to be over in 70 weeks. And, and, and he summed it up. He said to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy. To, and he said something at the end of verse 24 you should pay close attention to. To anoint the most holy. Isn't that something? See, they want to make it like there's no special individual coming. And, you know, you had plenty of people anointed, right? Yeah, Saul was anointed. David was anointed. They was both anointed by Saul, by uh, Samuel. So, yeah, you had people anointed from God to do great things. But nobody is anointed like this guy. Nobody. That's why Messiah don't mean just any anointed. Messiah means that re the anointed one. That's what it means. That's what Christ means. People say, oh, Christ is Greek. What difference do it make? It's just another word coming from another language. If I say Messiah or Christ, we're talking about the same thing. It means anointed one. And notice that it said that, read the end of verse 24 again. And to anoint the most holy. And to anoint the most holy. That's real important, right? Anoint the most holy? Who in the world could even do that? Who could anoint? Who's, who's holy enough to anoint the most holy? That lets you know you got, to, you got two top dogs here, two top beings. The Father and the Son. Only the Father could anoint the most holy. And so who is that talking about? That's talking about Jesus but go ahead, verse 25. Know, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem uh -huh. unto the Messiah, the prince. See, that's why they threw in Messiah, the prince. Because he said to anoint the most holy. He's the anointed one. Nobody been anointed like him for the job that he was, had to do. But people say, well, if he was somebody special, why did he die? Well, that's spelled out right here, too. That was part of the plan. Remember, he was slain from the foundation of the world. So, you know, it should be known by in Daniel. He talked about in Exodus, right? The lamb without blemish, right? That had to die. So that's why he's the most holy, had to be anointed. And then he even had to die. He's going to tell you that. So he gave you a set time to get to the Messiah, the prince. It's going to be how long? Shall be seven weeks mm -hmm. and three scores and two weeks. So he broke the 70 weeks down into 69 to get to the Messiah from the prophecy. So that's when Jesus came, 69 weeks or really 483 years from a particular day. We ain't dealing with that now. But he used all the time except one week to get here. Then when he got here, he used a half a week in his ministry, three and a half years. That's all he preached was three and a half years. That's why I know it's a half a week left. He's going to do that. He's going to wrap up the world when he come back and straighten it all out in quick fashion. But now, 69 weeks to get here. We ain't really dealing with that. Go ahead. Finish that. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Right, because that started in Ezra and Nehemiah time. That's when the prophecy went started. But it climaxed for the first time when the Messiah was anointed. The most holy was anointed 
in approximately 26 A.D. But go ahead, verse 26. And after three scores and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Okay, the Messiah had to come and start his stuff, do his thing. It took a certain, certain amount of time for him to come, but it's letting you know after he come, he had to be cut off. What do cut off mean? It means killed. That's what cut off means all over the Bible. He talked about if you don't do such and such, I will cut you off from the nation of Israel. He's talking about killing you. That's what it means to be killed. So people say, well, you telling me Jesus came and died. See, that ain't in the Old Testament. That ain't got nothing to do with God's doctrine. Look, here it is right here. The Messiah, the most holy got to come, but then he got to be cut off, right? right. Who he get cut off for? Did he do something wrong? Who? But not for himself. Oh, he got cut off, but not for himself. Jesus came and he had to be killed and he didn't do nothing wrong to deserve it. The same one that was anointed, the most holy that got anointed. He had to kill. And he even prophesied that after he was going to die, this, the Jerusalem was going to get destroyed again by the Romans. So he's telling you that right here. Go ahead. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. See, once the Messiah got cut off but not for himself, 40 years later, the Romans came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary all over again. Jesus told you about that in Luke 21. Luke 19, he told you about it too. Told you about it in Matthew 23. Matthew 24, he said, it won't be one stone left here upon another before this is over with. He told you about it. So it's talk talking about him being cut off, but not for himself, right? Then the people come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, read the top again, verse 26. Read that at the top. And after three scores and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. But now hold that thought right there. The Messiah be cut off, not for himself. Let's go to Isaiah 53. See, this is, this is what I'm saying. You don't have to read about Jesus in the New Testament. He said the scriptures testify of him. It said he was slain from the foundation of the world. You don't even need the New Testament to really prove Jesus who he is. Isaiah 53. The Messiah got cut off, but not for himself. You read this to some old Hebrew brothers, and they say, oh, that's talking about Israel. They don't know what to do with Daniel 9, because they didn't realize that the one that got anointed was most holy. So they don't know what to do with that. They ain't figured it out. One brother told me that it was supposed to be, I think he said Cyrus or somebody. So he's trying to tell me Cyrus is most holy. One brother recently told me it's Zerubbabel. I saw Zerubbabel most holy now, huh? And he didn't even talk, he didn't even say nothing back. But now, they say this is talking about the nation of Israel right here. This ain't no individual. Let's see. Isaiah 53 and 8. Go ahead. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Uh-huh. And who shall declare his generation? Why? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Oh, he was cut off. And it's telling you exactly how he was cut off, right? Didn't it say the Messiah had to be cut off, but not for himself in Daniel 9? Where it say he was cut off out of the land of the living. Why? For himself? Go ahead. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Oh, now we know why he was cut off out of land. He said he was cut off, but not for himself. No, not for himself. He didn't do nothing wrong. He was cut off for the transgression of my people. This is one individual died for the rest of the people, isn't it? That's right. But let's back up to <clears throat> verse uh, 3 and read a little bit more of it. Go ahead. He is despised and rejected of men, uh -huh. a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Uh -huh. And we hid, and we hid as it were our faces from him. Uh -huh. He was despised, and he was esteemed, and we esteemed him not. Mm -hmm. Surely he hath borne our griefs mm -hmm. and carried our sorrows. Go ahead. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. And afflicted. Uh -huh. But he was wounded for our transgression. Uh -huh. He was bruised for our inequity. See, he went through this for us. But go ahead. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Go ahead. See, this plan been around. Go ahead. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. See, that's talking about all the people, right? All the people that went astray. All of us. We turned everyone to our own way. So one individual had to come. He was anointed to come and save us. And the first step of him saving us was to die. 
That's what the Passover lamb was showing you in Exodus 12, right? Something had to die for you to survive, didn't it? Blood had to be shed so you can stay alive. That's the way it's always been. Go ahead. And the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, just like in Egypt, he put it all on that lamb. That lamb, that poor lamb had to die, hadn't done nothing wrong. They grabbed that lamb and said, come here. You got to die today. And a whole bunch of them died. But see, that was foreshadowing Jesus. Go ahead, because he's the lamb. Go ahead. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. See, he was oppressed. He was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. Go ahead. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Oh, there you go. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, right? But this was a real person here. Just like a lamb to the slaughter, though. Go ahead. And as a sheep before her shears is done. Uh huh. So he opened not his mouth. You ever pay attention when they when they was questioning Jesus? Jesus wouldn't even say nothing because he couldn't even he couldn't even help himself. If he would have talked so much, Pilate was looking for an excuse to let him go. Pilate just like, just give me an excuse, man. I know you ain't did nothing wrong. Just talk to me a little bit. Jesus, Jesus wouldn't even say nothing. Wouldn't even help him out. He wouldn't even help him. He wouldn't even help him, so Pilate even got mad. Don't you know I got proud in Jesus finally started? He said, man, you ain't got no power. Don't you know if it wasn't for the way it had to be, I'd be peeling your head. That's basically what he's telling him. He said, if it was... He said, if it, you, it's just not time for my kingdom. If it was time for my kingdom, we'd be fighting. Me and my servants would be fighting. It's not time. Then Pilate really got scared. He said, oh, man, what am I going to do with this cat? Then his wife calls him. Don't have nothing to do. Don't have nothing to do with that just man. And then he finally said, fine, I wash my hands of this. I'm going to do what y'all say do, but it's on y'all. And they said, yeah, we'll take it. So anyway, but he wasn't trying to defend himself at all. All he had to do is speak up a little bit, Pilate would have let him go. But he didn't do it because it said here he was as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. See, they locked him up and they cast a, had a little quick trial on him. Go ahead. And who shall declare his generation? Because everybody his age already got killed when Pilate, when uh, Herod was trying to kill him when he was a baby. So he was the only one his age, only male his age. Go ahead. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Uh -huh. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Go ahead, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked. Why? Because two thieves died with him, right? Go ahead. And with the rich in his death. But see, he did a good thing. Go ahead. Because he had done no violence. He didn't do nothing wrong. Go ahead. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Go ahead. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. See, it's part of God's plan. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Go ahead. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. See, that's what Jesus was. His soul was an offering for sin. He had to die. He had to give up his life for an offering, for to be a sin offering for us. That's the way God said it. And we have to recognize that. Go ahead. He shall, he shall see his seed. See, he's going he gonna to come back to life, though. He's going to see his seed. He's going to die, but he's going to wake up and see all that he's done, all his seed. Go ahead. He shall prolong his days. How do you get off of a sin and prolong your days? Unless you're getting resurrected, right? right? Go ahead. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. See, that's talking about the resurrection right then. So he's going to die, but he's still going to come out of verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul. That's the father going to see the travail of, his, of, the, of the son's soul. Go ahead. And shall be satisfied. Uh -huh. By his knowledge shall my righteousness, my righteous servant, justify men. Uh -huh. For he shall bear their iniquities. He's going to bear our iniquities. Go ahead. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. Uh -huh. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Uh -huh. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He poured his soul out unto death. Go ahead. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Two thieves right there with him. Go ahead. And he bared the, the sin of men. Uh -huh. And made intercessions for their transgressors. See, all this foretold in the Old Testament. Before you get to the New Testament. Now let's go to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 5. And we're almost done. 1 Corinthians 5. Because again, people call themselves an Old Testament Hebrew and they reject Jesus. And then you got the people that say they believe the New Testament, but they reject what Jesus is really about. They're going to give you another Jesus who died on Good Friday. They're going to give you the Good Friday Jesus and the Easter Bunny Jesus. They ain't going to give you the Passover Jesus. So 
Everybody is ignoring really what God's plan is. But Paul knew it. The New Testament knew it. It didn't hide from it. It didn't try to get away from it. First Corinthians five and seven. Go ahead. Purge out therefore the old leaven. Purge out the old leaven. See, that's what we're doing for this feast. But you only have the opportunity to purge out the old leaven is because the Passover lamb died for you. Purge out the old leaven. Go ahead. That ye may be a new lump. Uh-huh. As ye are unleavened. As ye are unleavened. That's why we keep the feast of unleavened. Because that represents us being pure with the Lord, walking purely with the Lord. As ye are unleavened, why? What give us a chance to be unleavened? What? For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now here in the New Testament, the Bible calls Christ our Passover. How in the world can we think we just going to ignore what he set up and go on about our business and he's still going to be on our side? He gave you the day to honor Christ and we're going to throw it away and make up our own days. Like God is not smart enough. For even, didn't say nothing about Good Friday, did he? I can see if he said Christ our Good Friday man or something. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, right? Go ahead, verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast. See, and that's what we're doing. We're keeping the feast. Because once the Passover lamb die, you go right into the feast. To show he passed you over so now you can walk with God according to his holy law. Unleavened. Therefore, let us keep the feast. How are we going to keep the feast? Go ahead. Not with old leaven. Not with old leaven. That's what we're getting ready to do after this. Not with old leaven. Neither with the leaven of malice ne and wickedness. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. You see what leaven stands for? All kind of wickedness and malice. False doctrine. That's why he got you on in the feast of unleavened bread. So, the Passover lamb has been Killed for you, sacrificed for you, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with what? But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see what the unleavened bread stands for? Sincerity and truth. The Lord showing you a great sign on how he's saving you, starting with the death of the Messiah, to what you got to do, because you got to do something. The Messiah is the only one who didn't have to do something right. He had to be sacrificed, but then you got to keep the feast, don't you? You got to recognize, you got to have faith in the Messiah. People say, see, y'all think it's based on works. No, it's based on faith and works. You got to have faith on the Messiah, on Jesus, first of all, first and foremost, right? And that will ignite you to do what he's telling you to do. In this case, keep the feast, right? We recognize the Passover lamb, then you Walk with him and serve him. That's what keeping the feast stands for. Serve him and him only, not worship God your own way. Now, you worship God with unleavened, right? Unleavened bread. One more place, Ephesians 5. This is just to show you in the New Testament because people, they are consistently telling us Jesus died and did it all, right? Jesus died and he did it all. Jesus died and he did it all. Jesus died and I don't have to do nothing. Jesus died for my sins. And you can't do nothing about it anyway. You couldn't do nothing anyway. Jesus did it. Jesus died and that's it. Look, that's a lie. That's why Paul just said, let us keep the feast. Keeping the feast stand for us walking with the Lord the right way, the straight and narrow way. Getting rid of all the falsehood and lies. So Jesus did die, but he gave you, a, he died to give you a chance to walk with him with unleavened bread. First, uh, Ephesians 5 and 1. Go ahead. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. We got to follow God as dear children. Go ahead. And walk in love. We got to walk in love. Now, that's walk a certain way, right? Yes. See, not talk in love. See, a lot of people want to talk love. Right. We had a lesson about love. Love is going to be exhibited by keeping the commandments, right? If you love the Lord, you won't break no law pertaining to him. You keep his Sabbath day, his feast days, because you believe in him and you know he's a jealous God. You don't want to be honoring no false God. If you love your neighbor, you won't be stealing from him, killing him, committing adultery with, on him. None of that, right? Covered in this stuff. So you're going to walk in love. Let us walk in love, not talk love. Let us walk in love. Who is the example? Go ahead. As Christ also have loved us. Oh, Christ loved us, right? Go ahead. And have given 
us, giving himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. Oh, Christ gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. But now after Christ had done that, people say, Jesus did it and that's it. You don't have to do nothing. Let's see if that's what Paul believed. He said, walk in love like Christ and loved him and gave, gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Smelling savor. What do we got to do after Christ and done what he did? Go ahead. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, uh -huh. let it not be one name among you. Oh, this ain't, this ain't talking about what Christ got to do right here, is it? Christ and did what he had to do, right? right? He offered himself. He's the Passover lamb. What is talking about now? What you got to do, right? right? If you're going to walk in love, he mean it. He said, look, Christ, did, now Christ had been offered according to this, right? But now he went further to say, but fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you. That's becoming such. That ain't something for Christ to do, is it? That's something for you to do or not do. Go ahead, verse 4. Neither filthiness. Some more stuff he don't want you to do. Neither filthiness. So don't let nobody tell you Christ died and I don't have nothing to do. Look, Christ died to start the process off. Now, after he became the Passover lamb, we got to keep the feast. We're sure we got to walk with the Lord the correct way. Neither filthiness. What else? Nor foolish talking. Not even foolish talking. Go ahead. Nor jesting. A lot of plan, you know. If you ain't going to sin by doing certain things, ain't no need to plan like it. Nor jesting, which are what? Which are not convenient, uh -huh. but rather giving thanks. Uh -huh. For this ye know. This ye know. Many people don't seem to know it, but we should. This ye know what? That no whoremonger. Oh, no whoremonger. Somebody just sleeping around, sleeping around, men or women. In this case, mainly referred to a man because women are referred to in the Bible as whores. See, you got a lot of rappers. They want to talk about hold this or hold this or hold here. But look, it can't be no hole without a whole monger. And that's what the Bible talking about. So somebody, somebody is making the whore mongers, right? Somebody is making the whore. For this ye know that no whore monger, right? No harmonger. What else? Nor unclean person. What else? Nor covetous man. What else? Who is an idolater. None of this. He said, you know what? Have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Oh, you ain't going to get into the kingdom of Christ and of God. So you can believe that Christ did it all for you. But see, the Passover is teaching you that he started it all for you. Now you got to walk with God from then on. Like we talked about earlier. You got to become a new creature. Go ahead. Verse 6. Let no man deceive you. It's, it's a wonder that he made this statement and nobody paying attention to because he knew people was going to deceive you, telling you, oh, none of that don't matter. Jesus died. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, I have all the time I run into people and that's what they telling me. I, I can't find them too much no more. I guess Satan keep them away from me because he know I'm going to tear them up. Like when I was driving a truck the last time I ran into this guy, he come trying to, I had a delivery at this place. He come trying to Trying to hand me, say, you, you accepted Christ as your personal savior? I said, nope. And that started off for him. And he said, oh, you have not You don't believe? I said, yeah, I believe in him, but I don't believe that it says anything about a personal savior. And I believe you got to walk with him. Oh, no, it's nothing you can do. He's smiling. It's nothing you can do. He did it all. I said, that means I can sleep with your wife, don't it? Oh, well, he stopped backing up there. He said, no, well. I said, no, if I, if I don't have to follow no rules, I can sleep with your wife. Well, see, he really almost wanted to say you could, but you wouldn't want to when you. He was messed up. But they come with these vain words telling you, like, it don't, you ain't got to do nothing. Jesus did it all. He told you that. What did he say in verse 6? Let no man deceive you with vain words. Those are vain words. Go ahead. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. This is the reason God coming back and going to beat this world down to the ground with wrath. Because people not obeying him. Thinking Christ died for him and that's it. Christ died for you to give you a chance to eat unleavened bread. To walk with him. Go ahead. Be not ye therefore partakers Don't with Don't be Jesus. partakers with him because we have been there and done foolishness.
But when you come to the Lord, you got to repent and start walking with him. Verse 8, and this is it. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Uh-huh. Walk as children of light. I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. <laughs>